Growing up, we had the Yiddish paper, the Algemeiner, in our home. And so to hear that, uh, to see and to hear Mr. David Afyun on Fox News yesterday, and to have him here in the room is a great honor and a great pleasure. So without further ado, <laughs> it's not the dog drink. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here has heard of Murphy's Law. <laughs> uh, my grandfather, after several unsuccessful business deals, decided that uh, Murphy was actually an optimist. <laughs> That's our experience on the way here tonight. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you have heard of the story of the rabbi who uh, always delivered a sermon that was exactly seven minutes long. Never one second over seven minutes. And it was the wonder of the town, his congregants were so happy that he never went over time. And then one day, he came to the podium and he spoke for 14 long minutes. And the congregants were up in arms. And they said to him, Rabbi, for 40 years, you have been delivering a seven minute sermon. And today, we don't understand what's happened. And he said to them, you know, I'm so busy during the week, I always prepare my sermon in the time it takes me to walk from my house to the synagogue. And it takes me exactly seven minutes. This week, I decided for the first time to take a detour through the park, and it took me 14 minutes to get here to Shul today. Well, friends, you'll be pleased to know it took me over two and a half hours to get here from Manhattan <laughs> with the traffic. I want to first of all thank you for your patience. Thank you to the esteemed rabbis that are with us here tonight. Uh, thank you to the Eternal Flame organization and to the George and Martha Rich Foundation for the community work that it does to educate the next generation on the lessons of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and the steps that each of us can take to fight prejudice. Of course, we are grateful for the leadership of Rabbi Arnstein in gathering each and every one of us here tonight and for the rabbis at the Chabad organization here in New Jersey. Of course, I'm also very grateful for each of you for making your way out here tonight. It's a cold evening, it's getting cold, and uh, it's late, and it shows a real commitment and dedication, care and concern for a world that everybody made the effort to be here. Tonight, we are in the presence of a Holocaust survivor I don't have to tell you, but to be in the presence of a Holocaust survivor is to be in the presence of history, to be in the presence of inspiration, and to be in the presence of lessons about life that all the years of college cannot teach you, cannot teach us. And I know this because I am the grandson of two survivors. I am named after my great-grandfather who was a Viennese rabbi who was butchered by the Nazis in the prime of his life. My young children today are three and six months are named after other family members who were stolen from us too soon by the horrors of Nazi hate. But, like many of you who are here today, I am also a child of what we call the information age. As young people living in the modern world, the information age world, we are duty bound to ask 
What are the lessons that we can learn from the black past? And how can we apply it to secure a better future? A future that is free of intolerance, a future that is free of hate, especially as people who are used to seeing results quickly and instantly and fast, and everything is immediate. The first thing I think of when I think, read, study, learn about the Holocaust, watch movies about the Holocaust, read books about the Holocaust, I always wonder how I would have been, what I would have done if faced with similar trials and challenges. Would I have risked my life to save the life of another? Would I have stood against the tide? Would I have just put my head down and gone with the flow and tried to hide and just say, there's nothing I can do about it. Would I have been Martha Cohn? Who would I have been? And the truth is that hopefully we will never know the answers to those questions. Because unless you've lived it, you can never know the answers. But perhaps we may be able to touch the tip of the icebergs by taking some responsibility for improving our world as we know it today. There was a story about a Jewish man who went to visit Germany shortly after the Holocaust to recover some of his family possessions. And he touched down at the airport in Germany and he was carrying with him a bag. And overcome with emotion, he turned to the first man who was standing nearby and he said to him, Sir, were you a Nazi? And the man said, not at all. I was a part of the resistance. My family helped save people. I was not connected with that at all. And he turned to another fellow and he said, accusing me of the same, were you a Nazi? And the man says, no, you know, I'm a recent immigrant to this country. I arrived after the horrors and atrocities of the war. And then he turned to another man and he said to him the same question. And the man hanged his head in shame and he said to him, I'm so ashamed to admit, but yes, it is true. I am a member, of, I was a member of the Nazi party. So he said, well, finally I found an honest man. Can you hold my bag for a minute while I go to the bathroom? <laughs> now it's a joke. But it isn't so funny because when we look around the world that we live in today, it's easy to see hatred everywhere, especially as information is proliferated at such a fast pace and we can see videos and imagery and pictures of barbarism and horrors that are committed around the world. For example, in our lifetime, in the shadow and the memory of the Holocaust, we never would have believed that a recent anti-defamation league global anti-Semitism attitude poll that polled 50,000 people in 100 different countries would find massive populations in dozens of countries around the world that hold prejudiced views towards the Jewish community. On U.S. college campuses, where many of you will find yourselves in the coming years, recent study has shown that up to 57% of Jewish students have witnessed or experienced anti-Semitism on campus. Another study carried about out by Brandeis University found that 75% of Jewish students have witnessed or experienced anti-Semitism on campus. But I'm here to share with you why, despite the challenges and despite some dark clouds over the horizon, I am nevertheless optimistic about our future and also how and why you should be and you can help change and mold that future. And there are two primary reasons. The first is the Jewish state of Israel. Now it is true that anti-Semitism today 
often takes the form of prejudice against the Jewish state. In fact, I don't know how many of you have read it, but the State Department has a definition of anti-Semitism. And there is a whole section in the State Department definition of anti-Semitism that talks about anti-Semitism as it relates to the Jewish state. For example, comparing the policies of the Israeli government to the crimes of the Nazis. For example, holding the Jewish state of Israel to a different standard as you would any other Western democratic country. These are all considered prejudice against the nation state of the Jewish people. But I'm optimistic because for the first time in thousands of years, we have a government, we have a representative, the Jewish people has an army, they have a home, a place where they can go. And the Jewish state has stood up on behalf of troubled Jewish populations in the former Soviet Union, in Arab countries in the Middle East where they were persecuted, in Ethiopia, more recently today in Donetsk in Ukraine. And it serves as a backbone for every Jew to stand strong and proud knowing that we have a home and we have a place where we can go and visit. But the second reason I'm optimistic is also a call to action. And that is because the information age has brought changes to our world that have put opportunities at our fingertips and strength and power at our fingertips that we have never had in history. In the last five or so years, in our lifetime, and we're not that old, we haven't been around for that long, we've seen the rise of what we call the democratization of information. With Facebook, with Twitter, with Pinterest, with Instagram, with LinkedIn, you name it, every single person has a real voice. Every person can fight for truth. Every person can fight against hate. Every person can instantly connect with somebody else who is not like you, who is the other, and strike up camaraderie and a relationship. Every person can stand up and be counted. In this climate, every single person in this room Every one of us, every one of you, is an editor-in-chief of your own Facebook page, of your own social circles, of your own email lists, of your own sphere of influence. But this is a message that every one of us has to take to heart. It's also a responsibility. Those of you who have watched Spider-Man, you will remember what Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, his parting words, with great power comes great responsibility. And this is a responsibility, a power that we all share. It's not just about posting your latest picture of what you did last night, or your vacation, or your friends. It's an opportunity to speak up for what matters, and to influence your world, and to influence your future. The great lesson of the Holocaust is to never, never be silent. Today, every single person has the tools to be heard. In our lifetimes, it is true that we will likely and hopefully never know the trials and hardships of Martha Coe. But we can mirror her spirit today if we resolve to never shy away, to be eternal flames, and to speak up loud and strong for everybody to hear. Now with that, I want to call upon Martha and her husband Major Cohn to present you with the Eternal Flame Award and I'd like to ask Diane Herzog and Gillian Fine 
to also please join us on the stage. Thank you. to carry the eternal flame of light and goodness to the next generation. 